Chapter 12. What was? Dull thuds resound in the distance, artillery pounding enemy positions in the countryside. Here in the city it's all close quarters, no really big bangs. Our orders are to limit the damage to the infrastructure, if we can. Only take buildings down if they block our route or contain a threat. So we move through, street to street, building to building, red to dead. There's noise up ahead, shouting. No doubt they're getting ready for us again. I point at the big makeshift barricade at the end of the street for Reynolds and she knows what to do. Her mech launches the rocket and the barricades are no more. We duck our heads as debris rains down. She just smiles out from the protection of her suit. I'm about to give the order to stay frosty and keep moving when suddenly there's a commotion over on the right flank and someone's running. Montez! I shout down the comms when I read that it's him. Get the fuck back over here! I look and see that a group of five or six previously hidden reds have abandoned their position and are pulling back at speed. He's on their tail. Disengage that pursuit! No way! He comes back. These red bastards have all got to die. Damn it. We've only been down here two hours and we're already falling apart. I order the squad to hold with the second mech and tell Reynolds to follow me as I scramble up over some rubble after Montez. Got one! He hollers happily as a burst from his rifle knocks a fleeing red to the ground in a black heap. I raise my rifle to my shoulder and manage to clip another one as the group moves for the cover of a little building along the street. They all get in through a doorway but the one I hit falls short. He's on the floor and tries to crawl after his friends, his arms dragging his wounded leg and body behind him. No chance. I see movement at the door. They must be waiting for him. I give Reynolds the order and she levels the little building. When the dust clears, there's nothing left moving. I round on Montez. You disobey an order like that one again and I'm gonna drop you and leave your body in the fucking rubble with them, you hear me? We've got a mission to complete. This is our fucking mission, Lieutenant, he replies angrily. Get down here and get the bad guys. I see red and I see red, remember? I hear a faint whistling that instantly grows louder as something flies over my shoulder, smashes through Montez's face and crashes straight into the mech. The explosion knocks Reynolds into a nearby shop front and then the shockwave throws Montez's corpse into me and barrels me along the road. I land with a thud into a wall. My chest hurts like hell and I look down to see a sharp piece of something stuck in my vest. I lie still for a moment to regain my composure. I'm about to try and move when I hear running footsteps from the building behind me. I stay still. Someone emerges into the street from the door of the building I'm lying against. It's a red. I guess it's the one who took the shot at us with the rocket since he's carrying some sort of launcher. He pauses for a moment to survey the scene. Probably gloating at his work. Outside there's a noise of falling glass and concrete collapsing. Reynolds must have regained her senses and started to pull the mech out of the rubble. The red has heard it too. He aims the launcher again to finish the job. No you don't. He looks over at me with those evil red eyes. My rifle's still in my hand. It's hard work but I've raised it up ready. I pull the trigger and blow pieces out of his torso as he drops to the floor. Black black. Where are they? Where are the children? I can hear strange noises in the distance. Explosions, I think. They're big, loud. How could they all leave us like this? How can he leave me alone, leave them alone? I hear the demons coming, close now. I peer through a hole in the barricade. They have some sort of machine with them. How did they get here so fast? I run into the nearest building and call out to the children again. Call their names call for them to return to me. We need to run. But to where? They're everywhere. There's an explosion outside and the building rocks around me. They're here. They might be coming in. They might be coming to take us. Through a window, I can finally see the children. They're hiding behind a wall. I shout out and they turn to see me. Run, I tell them. The demons are here. They start to run for an open door along the street behind them. Something happens and one of them falls. The rest keep going without looking back. They're nearly there when another one falls. No, I want to scream, but no sound comes out. The rest have made it. They're safe. The demons emerge in front of the building I'm in. They haven't seen me. One of them points at the building that the children are hiding in. 
and then the machine beside him fires something at it. It explodes. The building is gone. My children are gone. In my hand is one of the cannons that the clerics left us. I hold it like they showed us. I point it at the demons. I fire it and they die, like the clerics told us they would. I walk forward in a daze, out into the street. The big machine is lying on its side in a collapsed shop. Suddenly it moves, trying to stand back up while the shop front collapses all around it. I aim the cannon for another shot, for my vengeance, for my children. There's a noise behind me. I turn and see a demon lying there, waiting for me with its evil grin and its strange eyes watching me. Then all I see is black. Black. I see the looks on their faces, staring at me, at each other, at the data in front of them. And I can read what's going on behind their eyes too. It's not right, and we can't do this, can we? And what they might want me and others to imagine they're thinking about. But I know people like this. I chose them and I gather them here, by hook or by crook. And I know what they're really thinking. They're sat here along the long desk, expensive suits on one side and perfectly pressed military uniforms on the other. And it's, will we get away with this? And am I getting a big enough cut? That's what they're really thinking. Yes, I know people like this because I'm one of them. I'm greedy and self-interested and I always want more. No point in denying what you are. But unlike these clowns, I've got the eye for opportunities. I'm the man who makes the plans, while they just sit there and wait for them to fall into their laps. Well, I've dropped it into their laps now, and I can see they like the feel of it, whether they want to show it or not. It's funny to me the way people have to play this morality game. All of them are going to benefit from my proposal and all of them know it, but they still need to look at each other and act like they're good people. I don't understand it. You are what you are. Admit it and live it. But no, they need to feel like saying yes to this was something they struggled with or that something else made the decision for them and they were just swept along like leaves on a breeze. Never able to alter their destinies. Victims having to live with something they could never change. I've never had these problems. I'm not a victim. I make my own destiny and I know I can live with the consequences. This is getting boring, but the game can't be rushed. Finally, one of them decides to take it to the next stage. It's about time. You understand what this will mean, don't you? One of the generals says, his thick neck bulging out over the museum of shiny badges plastered to his chest. This will be war. Ooh, the W word. At least someone had the balls to say it. Only for a while, I assure him. By the time it begins, I, we, will have everything in place. I've already set those wheels in motion. Besides, the Reds' technology is at a high level, but their military competency is laughable when compared to the size and skill of the forces under your control. How does that ego feel? Nicely massaged? Here's one for your moral senses. In fact, I'm sure the Reds will capitulate early in the campaign. In the face of our superior war machine, and we'll get what we want, what we need, with the minimum of bloodshed on both sides. Half the self-deluded bastards in this room are now actually nodding their heads at that little piece of fantasy. Well, if it helps them sleep at night. Actually, I don't care if they sleep at night. I just care that I get them on side here and now. And with the morality box checked, we're just waiting for the next stage. Practicalities to begin. And here we go. War is an expensive business says a suit, and a very well-known one at that. She sat there with her blonde hair perfectly arranged and her trademark piercing blue eyes trained on me. How can we know that we won't just lose a hell of a lot of money on this and gain nothing at all? The correct answer is, didn't you listen to my fucking presentation? But it wouldn't do to speak to a lady in such a way, at least not one as powerful as this. My associates and I will be funding the initial costs as outlined in your information packages. But should further unseen costs be incurred, we will discuss forms of remuneration. I have one more question, she says. She doesn't, she has several, and most of the people sat around the table do too. Will this be expensive? Yes. Will it have to be an international venture? Not at first, but possibly in the end. 
Will this affect our cut of the profits? Yes, a big debate ensues. Question after question pops up and I knock them down. I'm prepared for everything they've got. When it ends, I want to laugh. It's almost amazing that, after all the sad eyes and big sighs at the start, the issue of morality was settled with one platitude, but the issue of money took well over two hours to deal with. Well, it would be amazing if it wasn't so predictable. With that out of the way, we're left with the final stage of the game, ass covering. Public perception is everything to the suits, either as individuals or as companies, and they will want to protect that. The generals need it too. Nobody's going to follow the orders of a man if they know he'll just throw their lives away so he can afford an even bigger retirement villa for himself. Who's it going to be? I will wait. Nobody outside this room can ever know about this. Not ever. It's my lovely blue-eyed politician again. Maybe not so lovely, given the hard look she's giving me. Those eyes really are piercing. My people did a great job with them. And nobody ever will, I smile reassuringly, before explaining again, and this was in the presentation and information packs, that there is probably nowhere in the galaxy as secure as this venue. The only way that anybody who's not in this room right now could ever know about this is if someone in here tells them about it. I pause at that, and everyone in the room looks at each other, but I know just as well as they do that nobody in here will be speaking about this of their own free will. Or if somebody manages to read their mind. And since my company hasn't found a way of doing that, at least not yet, that doesn't seem very likely. And what about the Reds? What if they suspect something before we act? A general this time, and a good question too. At last, something I don't already cover in the presentation. They won't, I tell him. Though I know that it would only take a few mistakes from him, his colleagues, or any of their people to change that fact. Still, I'm working on limiting the possibility any way I can. I have a good relationship with several of the highest red clerics. I'm visiting one of the ambassadors to discuss our people's bright joint futures together later today. There has even been talk of allowing me a visit to their homeworld. Very soon. That got their attention. In fact, if I'm to make that meeting, I must ask that this one ends. We need to come to a decision. Now. There is some umming and ahhing, some demands for certain stipulations that I can get out of later, but the end result is that I get my way. I always do. Then it's decided. We go to war. Nobody says no, and that's as good as a yes to me. Excellent. Job done. I feel like I should be happy at this. I've got what I wanted after all, but this has just been one move in the bigger game. Perhaps I'll be happy when the game is over, perhaps I'll feel a little flutter in my heart then. That might be hard though, if, like my mother used to always tell me, my heart is truly black. Black. Drowning. I swim through a million minds, a million million, a billion lifetimes, and then they're all gone, and all that's left is the thick water and I can't breathe. Drowning. Black.